where does pornography activate the brain? And it turns out that it's like everywhere. Just about every lobe of the brain is associated with sexual arousal and, and in some way, you know, you can get visual cortex stimulation, auditory cortex stimulation, imagination, emotional engagement. So every part of the brain, dopamine, is involved in pornography. And then the other thing that pornography is really good at is is really shutting off our negative emotional circuitry. Sex is really important. And so our brain is willing to push everything else away mm -hmm. in order to have sex and procreate. So it's, it's incredibly effective at really suppressing our negative emotional circuitry. And what we tend to see in any addictive behavior is that it gives pleasure and it takes away pain. A lot of people who watch pornography don't necessarily masturbate with it. Mm -hmm. So I've had, um, you know, people that I've worked with that will like just be watching it while they're like doing work, like on a second screen, mm -hmm. because it somehow sends those signals to the brain to like suppress our negative emotional circuitry. So it's a, it's a really weird kind of beast. Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, our guest is Dr. Alok Kanoja. He's a Harvard trained psychiatrist with a tremendous social media platform that reaches millions of people with online educational content. His expertise is in mental health and technology, and he's co founded the Healthy Gamer platform that coaches thousands of people on healthy gaming. Today, we talked about screen addiction as well as porn addiction. What is porn addiction? Who gets affected by it and how you can deal with it. We also talked about tantric or tantric sex and how it can benefit you physiologically and spiritually and what people are getting wrong about semen retention. We also talked about the challenges that young people face in dating these days, as well as the rise of artificial intelligence, particularly the future of artificial intelligent people or dolls that may impact the way we interact with society and potentially have devastating consequences. We hope you enjoy. Dr. K, Alok, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Rana. I'm so excited to have this conversation because you bring such a unique perspective, right? You have both Eastern traditional values that you've obtained from your life experience, as well as, of course, be going through the medical system here in the United States and becoming a physician trained in the U.S. So I think you bring a very unique perspective. And of course, obviously, mental health and the things that you deal with are so, so important. Yeah, thank you. And your content is so valuable. So if you haven't checked out Dr. K's uh, YouTube channel, Healthy Gamer, and on every other platform, uh, it's very, very helpful. So, you know, when I was listening to some of your older interviews, the one thing that I remember you saying is don't take your phone to the bathroom. And I remember listening to that <laughs> and being like, oh, my God, like, yeah, we shouldn't be taking our phone to the bathroom. But it's like this visceral reaction. Like, no, like, I can't go without my yeah, phone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so like, how, first of all, why are we so addicted to our phones that we have to take them with us to the bathroom? I, I think a couple of things. One is if we look specifically at the phone and specifically at the bathroom. Right? So I think one of the things that we've like lost is the ability to be bored. Mm -hmm. So if you really look at it, we try to externalize our attention and we try to have our attention constantly be on like a particular thing and be somewhat entertained. Yeah. Because if we especially look at the bathroom, it's like, what are you giving up? Mm -hmm. Right. It's not like you're doing any important work in there. It's not like you're going to be laughing really hard. Like, you know, sometimes like social media and technology is about like lots of fun. Mm -hmm. like, let's watch some cat videos. And and so really it's about sort of fast forwarding our mind, accelerating through that boredom. And um, and I think what we've sort of found is that there is a device that's able to do that, to constantly externalize our attention. And it, even though it's super low stakes, I think we sort of see the depth of the addictive nature when we're so unwilling to give up something that's like, who cares if you're... It's so you know, innocuous, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you don't need it. You really don't. But it's like such a like, oh, that's my... Some people use it as their time to like, oh, they just spend more... And that can create its own problems. But like they spend more time in the bathroom, like scrolling through their phone and they're like, no one's going to bother me in here. Absolutely. I mean, by some people like probably all people <laughs> yeah. and especially people like young parents you know yeah. I, I think it's like especially with how much because the other challenge with technology is that it invades every corner of our life so if you're working like your boss is going to be texting you emailing you whatever if you're a parent like you know if your your kids subconsciously know that if you're kind of around that they can bother you mm -hmm. and so sometimes the bathroom is like the only place of refuge <laughs> where you get privacy yeah but it's it's important to be bored right like i think that's a really important part of our life that we've lost to some degree because of all this constant stimulation yeah i mean i, th I think there's so many consequences of no longer being able to be bored 
So some of the things that I see is that there's just a complete lack of like introspection. Mm -hmm. You know, I sort of fell into this in an interesting way because for me, it was like, I want to be super efficient. So I remember when I was in med school, like, okay, it's like I wake up in the morning and when I'm like making breakfast, I'm going to be listening to a lecture, listening to a lecture when I'm walking to the train. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be like reviewing something when I'm, you know, on the train. And then like every moment of my time is like podcast or learning about something or being efficient. But at this, at the end of the day, it's still like externalizing my attention and I don't listen to myself. Mm -hmm. And if we look at it kind of evolutionarily, like human beings used to have a lot of time with themselves. Like we'd be like hunter gatherers and doing like rote work where the mind is unoccupied. So I think evolutionarily, we really need that for things like emotional processing and stuff like that. Yeah, and I can relate to that trying to be very efficient. I'm sure it's a lot of people who are high achieving or trying to be high achieving will do that. Like I will, I remember studying for the boards when I was a full-time resident, working all the time, having two kids at home and being like, okay, I need to like, maximize this time that I have in the car because this is like time I can get some work done. But you're right, it does lead to this sort of like go, 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 go and never taking a moment to just be like, oh, you know what, like maybe I need to just take a second. Yeah, so the, the really crazy thing there is that I, I think that a lot of people don't realize that spending more time doesn't actually improve things. Mm -hmm. So my first year of med school, I, I struggled a lot because everyone was like studying so much. And then I sort of realized like this is not working for me. And so I, I actually started only studying like two hours a day and that was like it. Yeah. So I'd study for two hours in the morning. I'd go to my classes and stuff like that. And then I'd be like done by 4 p.m. And what I sort of found is that my retention actually went way up and like my focus went way up. And even now when we work with content creators, one of the big things that we're able to do is help them improve their metrics. So they'll get like 171 to like 200% increase like view counts and stuff sub counts, follower counts, um, but without increasing the amount of work that they do. So I think one of the big things that we've sort of lost is that like, we don't know how to make our mind efficient. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've experienced this where there are some days where you're studying for boards and it like everything just sinks in and it's like a really good day. And then there are other days where you're like highly distracted and you're, you're on your third cup of coffee and it's like, you're really struggling. Absolutely. And I think it's so interesting when you tell that story is I'm very similar. So my husband who went to medical school also was like a studier, like he's like always studying. So like, I remember him telling me like, start studying for step one, which is a big exam we take, you know this, but for the audience, it's a big exam we take in medical school that helps determine how competitive you can be to match into residency. And so he started studying like months earlier and he told me you should start studying, but I am not that kind of person. Like I tend to do well if I do a focused amount of studying for a month or two, like, but not six, six yeah. months out. Right. And so I tried to do it and it was futile for me. And I also am the kind of person who does like very focused amount of small amount of studying, but I don't tend to do hours and hours of it because it doesn't work for me. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting concept that a lot of people, yeah, they, they don't realize like spending more hours. And the first time I realized that I think in and externally was reading that book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, because he talks about how much work he would get done in four hours. And it's like, yeah, if you are efficient and think about it, clearly you can get a lot done. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, porn addiction, sure. because I think that's a really um, hot topic. And I think, you know, in terms of the mental health uh, space, there's no real term for porn addiction. It's like problematic porn use, right? Uh, but we see it. And in the literature, it's probably like 4% it has been described. But I think, you know, we're seeing more and more of it, uh, particularly in the younger population as they're sort of um, seeing pornography earlier. How often are you seeing porn addiction? And what are your thoughts on it? So I see it a ton. Mm hmm. And um, I, I think there are some problems in the literature. So like, I, I'm not gonna talk about porn addiction specifically, but just to use an analogy. So if we look at gaming addiction, so in 2010, the incidence of, or the prevalence of gaming addiction was about 6%. I think in 2020, it was like nine to 11%. Mm -hmm. But that's, remember- That's pretty high. It's very high. So 6% is around the same rate as alcohol. Mm -hmm. So like, we're like, we have twice as many video game addicts. But then the other really troubling thing is, remember this is prevalence of the whole population. And we don't have a lot of people over the age of 50 who are addicted to video games. Mm -hmm. So what we're really seeing is that even if you look at 10% of the population, it's not the population as a whole. What we're really seeing is like 20% of kids, which is staggering. That's a lot. One in five. Yeah, probably something like probably. that. Um, and and so, you know, I, I talked to some, like I remember I just had a conversation with like a second grade school teacher who was like 100% of the boys in my class play Fortnite. Mm -hmm. And this was about four years ago. 
So if we look at pornography addiction, I think we probably have a very similar thing mm -hmm. because especially with the tech addictions, the likelihood that these people will enter a psychiatrist's office is very low. So men are more are less far less likely to seek mental health support. I think if you look at it historically, about seventy percent of patients are women. Yeah. Um, and so, first of all, there's like a gender kind of lack of recognition there. I think even amongst patients who come in for things like mood disorders or anxiety disorders, they're very reluctant to volunteer that they have a pornography addiction. Mm -hmm. So you really have to ask. It is not a very common part of like a standardized interview. Yeah. I, I suspect that it's probably higher than 4%. I think so, especially with newer types of pornography. But I will say that there are plenty of people who watch pornography in a healthy manner and don't develop addictions. So what is sort of, and this can be in any field, gaming addiction, porn addiction, what happens to the brain or, and it, that causes these addictions? So with porn addiction, I think there are a couple of interesting things. The first is that, so this is more of a clinical practice as opposed to literature search. But what I've noticed is that pre-pubertal exposure to pornography seems to like really increase the risk. Now there could be some confounding variables there because if you think about what kind of childhood does someone have to have to be exposed to pornography at the age of eight. Mm -hmm. So there may be like less parental supervision and other kinds of factors at play. But oftentimes these people are exposed to pornography like very young. The second thing that we sort of know is if you look at like the neuroscience of pornography, I tried to figure this out. I was like, okay, we know that alcohol addiction is like GABA receptors in the brain. Mm -hmm. So where does pornography activate the brain? And it turns out that it's like everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, just about every lobe of the brain is associated with sexual arousal and and in some way, you know, you can get visual cortex stimulation, auditory cortex stimulation, imagination, emotional engagement. So every part of the brain, dopamine, um, is involved in pornography. Uh, every neurotransmitter is involved in pornography in some way or the other. So we, we sort of have this kind of whole brain effect and then the other thing that pornography is really good at is is really shutting off our negative emotional circuitry. So if we think about evolutionarily, like sex is really important. And so our brain is willing to push everything else away mm -hmm. in order to have sex and procreate. So it's it's incredibly effective at really suppressing our negative emotional circuitry. And what we tend to see in any addictive behavior is that it gives pleasure and it takes away pain. Mm -hmm. And over time, the amount of pleasure that it gives actually goes down. Mm -hmm. So as we develop some degree of like dopaminergic tolerance and things like that, it doesn't even offer much pleasure. And so then people really get hooked on it from like an emotional regulation standpoint. The more stressed they are, the more pornography they watch. And the last thing that a lot of people are super confused by is that a lot of people who watch pornography don't necessarily masturbate with it. Mm -hmm. So I've had, um, you know, people that I've worked with that will like just be watching it while they're like doing work, like on a second screen, mm -hmm. because it somehow sends those signals to the brain to like suppress our negative emotional circuitry. So it's a, it's a really weird kind of beast. Well, and then they develop sort of, they feel even worse when they're not watching it, right? That's a hallmark of addiction. Yeah, so that that's absolutely true. So, we, and that gets really ugly really fast. So there's all the shame from being addicted to pornography. And then how do we manage that shame by watching more pornography and suppressing it? Yeah. And then when we stop watching it, all of those dormant emotions, there's almost this rebound effect and we feel like a in very intense shame and things get way worse. And that's how we get hooked. Yeah. You know, just on your point about children getting exposed to porn. So I actually just spoke to an expert on this who's done a lot of research. And essentially, it's the average age where kids are being seen seeing porn is like 12 or 13, but as early as eight or nine or yeah. 10. And and often it's not that they're getting it because they're they're getting sometimes it's access to devices that they are there are no parental controls but oftentimes it could be a friend's device or a friend shows them something a picture that they don't really understand and, and actually they're seeing issues of it in schools even because they'll be like talking about it and showing them things and so I think it's I, I, I caution in saying that I don't think parents are intentionally not supervising their children I think that sure. generally like there's it's so accessible, right? Like it's Absolutely. so easy to get access to free pornography now. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I think that it, in many of the cases that I've seen, it's even things like older siblings or friends of older yeah. siblings who are showing them this kind of stuff. Because like if you're eight, right, and you've got an older brother and your older brother is going through puberty with his buddies and they're like watching something, you're super curious about it. Yeah. And so we absolutely, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Thanks for clarifying. 
Yeah, and I think, so you said like being exposed to it at a younger age puts you at a higher risk, but what are some other risk factors? Like how can, if you are either with someone or your child and you're, you want to maybe catch them, not in a bad way, but like protect them from developing this addiction and you might start seeing hallmark signs if, or gaming addiction for that matter. Yeah, so I, I think it depends on which addiction we're talking about. So, you know, we're still learning this stuff, but we're not really sure how different gaming addiction is from pornography addiction. I happen to think that they're quite different. And there's even a fair amount of research that within gaming addiction, it's not all homogenous. So there are many different types of gaming addiction. That's kind of the first thing that I would say. But in terms of how to protect people from it, I think there are a couple of things to consider. The first is that generally speaking, as we said, the earlier you get exposed to something, it actually alters your nucleus accumbens and how it develops. So we sort of know that marijuana is a gateway drug. And the reason it's a gateway drug is because it alters your brain's receptivity to other dopaminergic or addictive substances. And so porn pornography addiction, I suspect, will probably work in a similar way where it sort of predisposes you to certain things. Um, in terms of what we can do about it, I think sort of like having a really good relationship with your kid and even sort of talking to them about some of this stuff that, hey, pornography exists, and I guess we have to start pretty young. Mm -hmm. Like, I have an eight-year-old, and I've never thought to talk to her about <laughs> pornography, but it makes me really wonder, because eight is like really, really young, right? I think uh, I started talking to my son about sex around eight or nine. Uh, I didn't talk about pornography until he was 10, uh, but I definitely have talked to him about it um, already <laughs> yeah so that's <laughs> I, th I think you're ahead <laughs> it of the makes curve me super uncomfortable but yeah. i've done it yeah, yeah. so i i think just sort of an awareness of it and i think that a lot of parents i think maybe like we're a little bit luckier because i think we sort of grew up with some technology but i, I think a lot of parents really just let their children use devices Right. So there's sort of this idea, especially in the West, that like if you get an object, it's yours. Mm -hmm. And so it, this gets really problematic when like grandparents want to like give them something for Christmas. Right. But grandma or grandpa doesn't have to deal with the iPad every day after the kid gets it. Yeah. They don't have to get them to like stop uh, using it so that they can study and do their chores and wake up and go to bed and all this kind of stuff. So I, I think really being involved in your child's technological life is like really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when it comes to like gaming addiction, I think where a lot of parents really sort of mess up, I mean, that's kind of harsh to say, but what we found really is very effective is that, see, as a, as a parent, we get scared. And once we get scared, we sort of have this instinct to like, let's take this thing away that's bad. But oftentimes what we find with like gaming addiction and technology addiction is that when you try to take the child's device away, they fight you. And I've heard like really, not heard, I mean, people have, that I've worked with have really drastic stories of, you know, parents locking up power cords in the liquor cabinet. And then the kid will like learn how to pick locks on YouTube <laughs> and will go downstairs at like 1230 when everyone's asleep, unlock the power cord, we'll play games until five in the morning, we'll lock it back up and then we'll go to sleep. Wow. So if your child like wants to do it, right? It's going to be really hard. You can try to be very controlling, but even then, I don't know if you're doing a great job of preparing them for the world mm -hmm. because at some point they're going to get access to technology mm -hmm. and you're not going to be around to control it. So what we really advocate for is like forming a good relationship with your kid where you're really communicating with them. And that can be really hard for a number of reasons, which we can go into. And then also recognizing that people who fall into addiction do so because they're getting something from the addiction that is hard for them to get in the rest of life. Mm -hmm. So for something like pornography addiction, very poor emotional coping mechanisms in general, right? And that's not the person's fault. It's just this, they just weren't taught this kind of stuff. And they didn't get to develop it because they developed the addiction instead of developing Absolutely, that. Absolutely, right? So yeah. as you develop the addiction, your other emotional coping mechanisms start to atrophy because your brain knows we have this thing over here that works so incredibly well at suppressing our emotions. So we usually recommend that parents will like talk if you if, if you have a kid who is addicted to video games or pornography or, or, or anything you know at the underlying that is going to be some kind of emotional turmoil so sort of asking them a little bit about other parts of their life and recognizing that addiction and there's some people in the psychiatric community that don't even believe that technology addiction is real 
um, and these are experts who work with these people day in and day out, they think it's a manifestation of a deeper problem, mm -hmm. which there's absolutely some evidence for. But really sort of recognizing that if you're dealing with an addiction, really trying to get to know your kid and asking them like, hey, what's going on in your life? How's school going? How do you feel about romance, relationships, things like that? Because uh, a lot of times, like adolescents and teenagers, like, you know, it's really hard for them to engage in that stuff. I think sometimes they can hide it quite well in terms, and they may be irritable and they may be sort of not chipper and happy all the time. But are there other sort of signs that maybe someone could say, like, hey, they, they could have something going on that I'm maybe I should delve a little deeper into how they're using technology or pornography or things like that? Yeah. So I, I think parental instinct really goes a long way. Like, if you think your kid has a problem, there's a pretty good chance that they have a problem. And I think what we tend to look at is, like, functional impairments, right? So is there any change in their grades? Or has there been a change in their, like, professional life, physical health, mental health, relationships, including family relationships? So if you're finding that you're getting into arguments with your kid a lot, um, and I think parents are very quick to, like, attribute that to, oh, this is, like, teenage whatever right it's just a phase mm -hmm. and that that can be very true it can be just a phase but really sort of opening the door to talking to your kid and really figuring out okay what are you upset about oftentimes it is things like moodiness and stuff like that that parents will see the most of when was the last time a doctor spent an hour with you and truly focused on your goals and when was the last time you left feeling like you really understood what was going on with your body and had a clear plan of what was going to happen next at my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to do just that. I specialize in sexual dysfunction, bladder health, hormone health, and pelvic pain for all people. And I want to revolutionize how we take care of patients. I want to really get to know each and every one of you. That's why at my practice, when you come to see me, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. And after you leave, if you forgot to ask me something or need clarification on something we talked about, don't worry. I'll respond to your issues and questions quickly through our secure messaging portal without any additional costs. Just go to www.renamalikmd.com dot com slash appointments and schedule your visit today. We see patients in Irvine and Beverly Hills, California, and virtually for patients from California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. If you aren't located in these states, consider making an educational visit where we can talk about your conditions generally, but I can't diagnose or treat you. I can't wait to see you. You actually, um, be became a monk, right? You went to India um, and you learned sort of many practices from Eastern uh, philosophy. And one of the things I've heard you talk about is tantric or tantric sex. And so can you talk a little bit about what that is? And is it something that people should be trying to achieve? <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. I've never gotten that question. Um, but yeah, so we can absolutely talk about it. So in order to understand tantric sex, we have to understand what meditation is and what tantra is and how sex can be used. So this is going to get a bit technical. So the first thing to understand is that anytime you meditate, you need something called an alambana, which is a support. So usually there is a focus of meditation. So you can have something like prayer beads, you can chant a mantra, um, you can gaze at a candle or even like an idol or something like that. There's, there, there's usually a... a an object of your attention. So if we look at meditation, the word meditation gets translated into three Sanskrit words, and this is what confuses a lot of people, dharana, dhyan, and samadhi. So dharana is a focusing technique. It's a verb. It's something that you do. So I'm focusing on, let's say, a candle. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at that. And the whole point of that is if you look at your mind, it has lots of thoughts. So how do you get your mind to not think lots of thoughts? By having it focus on one thing. So if I concentrate on one point, then all of the other thoughts, as I train myself and I practice, all of those other thoughts will go away. Then what happens is the mind has a very natural tendency to lose track of a constant stimulus. So when we will acclimatize to a stimulus. So if I like, um, you know, if you step into a restaurant, at the very beginning, you hear everyone talking, but then your brain acclimatizes that stimulus mm -hmm. and it weeds it out. Mm -hmm. So what we do in meditation is we focus on one thing to push everything else away, and then we're left with one thing. And over time, we will acclimatize to that in the same way that we'll acclimatize as soon as I put my jacket on, I feel it, but then my brain sort of recognizes this is a constant stimulus and it goes away. Mm -hmm. Once we acclimatize to that candle, then 
our all mental function stops and we enter the meditative state, which is dhyan. So dhyan is a meditative state that is a state of consciousness. So it's not something that you do. The best example here is going to bed and falling asleep. Mm -hmm. Technically, like no human being on the planet can go to sleep. We can't say I'm asleep now. <laughs> we can lay down and in the right circumstances, sleep is a state of consciousness that will happen to us. Mm -hmm. And if you're like me, it's like in biochemistry, <laughs> right? So we don't want it to happen, but it happens anyway. That's yeah. how the states of consciousness happen. So we have alambanas, which are like objects of focus, and then we want to enter the state of meditation. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk a little bit about sex, and then we'll put them together. So, uh, and then the third state of meditation is samadhi, which is like a more transcendent state of consciousness, which is blissful and whatever, we'll get to that. So now if we look at sex, like if, if we look at orgasm or sexual activity, it's a very potent draw for your attention. Mm -hmm. So if we look at kind of the neuroscience of it, like it's really easy to not get distracted when you are engaged in a sexual act. And then the next thing to understand is that people will say that the state of orgasm is like a state of dhyan or samadhi. So it's a mm -hmm. blissful state. And if you really pay attention to your mind and orgasm, during the moment of orgasm, you actually don't have any mental functioning. You can't think about anything You can't else. think about anything, right? Mm -hmm. So the moment after orgasm is over, then you're like, was it good for her too, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and like before you're thinking lots of thoughts and after you're thinking lots of thoughts. And this is why we love sex so much because if we really look at when the mind is peaceful, the mind is peaceful when it's actually shut off. Mm -hmm. This is why we love drugs. This is why we love sleep. This is why we love losing ourselves in a sunset and orgasm. Mm -hmm. So th there's a orgasm kind of creates that like no mind state. It's one of a very easy, accessible physiologic ways. So when we put these together, what we end up is uh, end up with is sex is a powerful alumbana that focuses our mind. Mm -hmm. And then the state of orgasm is a very, very good way to get to samadhi or dhyan. Then we get into some problems. So the, the whole point of tantric sex is that, okay, so but if we want to enter that no mind state, like generally speaking, orgasm is incredibly brief mm -hmm. um, if you're a dude. <laughs> uh, um, and so, many women. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so then the goal of, of tantric sex is there are certain like yogic techniques that you can use to prolong the state of orgasm. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what you're trying to do is avoid ejaculation because mm -hmm. that's the thing that triggers the orgasmic state in the brain to end because then we're done, right? We've done our, our thing evolutionarily. So some of those techniques around tantric sex are to delay ejaculation, but then you can actually get this sweet spot where there's orgasm without ejaculation, mm -hmm. which is some of the point of tantric sex. Now there's a whole other layer to tantric sex, which is even more spiritual. This is sort of more neuroscientific and technical. Mm -hmm. But uh, during really traditional tantric sex, people are chanting mantras, um, and you're chanting a mantra with your partner over the course of potentially hours. And it's almost like doing a ritual or a puja or something like that, where it's like part of a religious practice. And for some reason, using the sexual act as like a focus and like kind of getting into these states of consciousness and chanting mantra, which is really the traditional way to do tantric sex, um, is is what it's about. And I think that's, I mean, I can go into more detail if you really want to, but there's a whole spiritual side. Yeah. So then, you know, people talk, I think they've tried to adapt those things in today's day and age with semen retention. They've, there's things like No Nut November where people, try, and I, they don't they're always practice in the tantric method, but that's sort of the goal is to orgasm without ejaculation. So from an Eastern perspective, w benefits in terms of doing it on a regular basis or, or trying to achieve that? Benefits of tantric sex? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it depends. What kind of answer do you want? Do you want like a physiologic answer, a neuroscientific answer, or a spiritual you answer? You can give all three. Okay. So this is where things get weird. Um, and it, you know, so part of what I try to do is like reconcile these spiritual answers with like neuroscience and physiology. So if we start with the physiology, I'm not sure. So if you look at like basically every l religious tradition, restricted sexual activity is part of most religious traditions. We're not quite sure why, but chances are that when you engage in sexual activity, it alters your physiology in some way. So what I've sort of found is that when I am celibate for periods of time, um, which is interesting being married, 
<laughs> it, and when I'm celibate for periods of time, it really enhances the quality of my meditation. So I don't know what's going on physiologically there. Um, what I just a, a couple of things to theorize. So if you look at some of the yogic postures that we do when we are celibate, we'll do something called siddhasan. So in Siddhasan, you press your heel against your perineum. Mm -hmm. So especially for men, the, the blood flow to your scrotum and your sex hormone production can be gently suppressed by reducing the blood flow to that area. So you're kind of like, you know, and then you'll, you'll even get sometimes, I imagine, testicular atrophy if you do it for a long period of time, which is what yogis are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so then if you look at, okay, if we reduce our testosterone levels, what effect does that have on our brain? It probably has some kind of positive effect for attaining transcendent states of consciousness. Okay. So we're not quite sure what of that is true. There's another layer, which is that, which is a little bit more like, spiritual theory but we don't really know if it's true and that's that see anytime <laughs> you have sex it creates a powerful impression mm -hmm. so if we think about how something enters your mind generally speaking the more active your mind is the less something enters so let's take the example of studying if i'm in a library and the library is burning down and people are making lots of noise and my mind is paying attention to all of that stuff anything i read on the page is not going to sink in mm -hmm. if i'm in a quiet place and i'm not distracted and anyone knows this if you're not distracted then you can study and then the knowledge will literally sink in mm -hmm. otherwise it's like the information is bouncing out of your mind right so the more no mind state we have the more stuff sinks in and if we look at stuff like the flow state Flow state is a very almost no mind state. So the mind is fully focused on one thing. So you have a lot of like whatever you're studying in that moment will, will really sink in. So now let's look at sex. So what happens in sex? We enter that no mind state during orgasm. So in that moment, there is a very powerful impression that sinks into your mind. From an evolutionary standpoint, this is probably has something to do with like if we look at oxytocin, the oxytocin release after orgasm, mm -hmm. which is usually induced especially by things like cuddling and and mm -hmm. human human uh, you know contact. But there's something that goes on that there's a physiologic bond that forms with people who have sex. Now I've worked with people like sex workers, and they have to train themselves mm -hmm. to shut off that bond. So yeah. their natural reaction at the very beginning is to release oxytocin, but the whole point is then they try to like avoid that. So if we look at sex, then what happens is we create a very powerful impression. And then what happens is once we shut off our mind, whatever is lying in the subconscious will start to float to the surface. So when I work with patients who have a history of trauma, I don't tell them to do standard mindfulness techniques where they just let whatever is in the mind come out. Okay. So oftentimes it will trigger traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the evidence-based techniques around mindfulness for trauma, they're usually grounding techniques or like sensory techniques, things like ice diving, where I'm taking a bucket of ice and I'm sticking my face in it. Mm -hmm. That's not letting whatever is in my mind flow up. It's actually doing the opposite. There's lots of stuff in my mind and I empty my mind by sticking my face in ice. So whatever is in the mind will come up. And anytime we have sex, it goes deep into the mind. Yeah. And so if you sort of think about it, right, like if you meet someone once and, and you have a one night stand and then you're going to start thinking about them the next day, right? So most human beings, I think, will. Yeah. And so if you sort of think about it, there's powerful impressions that form. So then what happens is if we like try to meditate and you've like had sex, it becomes very hard to enter those transcendental states of mind. I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, I think it's very interesting because, you know, I don't, I, what I tell people is like, if you want to practice semen retention or celibacy for the purposes of spiritual or um, betterment that you feel better, I think it's wonderful. But I do worry that there's a lot of pressure for people to uh, participate in these sorts of things. And they actually develop, they, it becomes so forefront of mind because they're like, when am I going to have sex? Like, I can't wait to have sex because they're so like, they're, they're trying so hard to abstain. And then they also start clenching their pelvic floor and they develop pain or other issues. And so that's sort of where I worry as a clinician who sees those patients. Yeah. So I think those people are doing it backwards. Right. So like, uh, let's talk about, you know, in the yogic traditions, the word for celibacy is brahmacharya. But brahmacharya doesn't mean celibacy. It means to dwell in Brahman, which is to dwell in the infinite. Mm -hmm. 
So technically, you can have sex if you're a yogi and you can still be a brahmachari, which means celibacy. So brahmachari, what it really means is non-lustfulness. So forcing yourself and struggling with yourself in the mind to not have sex still means that your mind is obsessed with the sex. Yeah. You're missing the point, right? So if you look at like a yogi, um, <laughs> you know, when a yogi is like people, I don't know if this makes sense, but people will try to deprive themselves mm -hmm. in order to like become more like detached, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to have sweets. I'm not going to have this kind of food. I'm not going to have this, but the mind still wants it. The mind still wants it. They're trying to basically starve their mind of the stimulus. Yeah. But the real thing is if you practice meditation for a long period of time, the desirelessness becomes natural. Right. So if I stop and I like look at, let's say we've got like two glasses of water here and one is the temperature I want and one is the temperature that I don't want. And as I look at this, if I drink water that I don't like the temperature, this creates unhappiness within me. But as I do yogic practice and I detach from that unhappiness, then it doesn't matter which one that I have because I, the negative impact of the desire doesn't actually land. So I think a lot of these people are doing this backwards, whereas if you practice yoga, you will become more detached from the world. Naturally, your mind will be less desirelessness. You're not bludgeoning it into submission. That's so useful because I think you're right. Most people are doing it wrong. They are like forcing themselves into submission when it's actually the way you're describing it, and if, tell me if I'm wrong, is that it's part of your meditative practice. Like you continue to become free of all these thoughts in your mind through a meditative practice and then the desire for sex goes down and then you realize when you have sex that oh it's actually affecting your meditative practice yes. negatively so then the desire to avoid sex or abstain for periods of time is stronger uh, very well said right yeah. so so i think this is something that people don't like so i think it's important sometimes you have to conquer a desire fine you have to strengthen your frontal lobe and restrain a sexual impulse fair enough but i think what with what you're describing like doesn't work like even in psychotherapy so if we understand something like ocd right mm -hmm. so this is a case where someone has these intrusive thoughts mm -hmm. which there's a wrestling with and fighting with and the more that you fight with your mind the less healthy you're going to be so a really good example for people who don't have OCD is think about like stressing about going to sleep. Oh my God, I need to go to sleep. I need to go to sleep. I need to go to sleep. The that. more that you stress <laughs> about sleep, the more you're like, oh, fuck. Can I say? It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so like, fuck it, I need to sleep, right? And then like the more you stress about it, the harder it becomes to sleep. So in that same way, there's almost this weird thing that we see in psychiatry with like defense mechanisms and reaction formation that the more you suppress something, you're sort of fueling that tension in the mind mm -hmm. and tension in the mind and conflict in the mind will never lead to peacefulness. So what I usually have when, when I, I work with people who are interested in like no, not uh, November, and we have a lot of people who have unhealthy relationships with pornography in our community, is we try to teach them this kind of stuff, right? You can try to force yourself to do it, and that can have some value. But it's way easier to sublimate your desire than it is to conquer it. Yeah, because the other thing physiologically, right, is your body will sometimes ejaculate on its own at night, right? You'll yeah. get nocturnal emissions. So it's not the act of ejaculation, I think. It's probably the act of being with someone and having those other hormonal connections with that person that, that may have a physiologic impact. But we know that people ejaculate at night, right? It happens, especially the younger you are, the more testosterone you have, the more ejaculation you're going to have at night and that's normal physiologic healthy yeah. not a problem and so i think that people get very fixated on like oh i need to not ejaculate and then they'll have a nocturnal erection or ejaculation and they will feel so much deep shame that they failed and that's not the point i think that's really important because i um you know again this is something that people struggle with and they really they want permission to not do it because they're like hearing all these benefits but i think again the thought is that you have to conquer it versus you actually have to yeah so when i work with people who are like really interested in in no not november like usually my question is like why yeah like what's driving your desire to like not not and and usually it's like some kind of weird transmutation of something else like they mm -hmm. It becomes a proxy battle for them where like I need to conquer this thing because I'm unable to conquer something else. Generally speaking, I, I don't have, you know, I've never worked with anyone who's like happy and content and is obsessed and beating themselves up over No Not November. Yeah. Usually the picture that I see anyway is someone who's like addicted to pornography and in an effort to conquer their pornography addiction, they're going to do No Not November or No Fap or something like that. And then in that process, it can be good because... 
it's not that nofap has all these magical benefits, but if you look at the harms of pornography addiction, and then you start doing nofap and you free yourself of that physiologic cycle, that can be a net positive. I think that's reasonable. Um, what are what are some techniques that you use for people who have porn addiction? Like, how do you help them get through that? I, I think a lot of it is like understanding their emotions. So when I think about pornography addiction, so remember that any addiction brings pleasure and takes away pain. So if you can reduce the need to take away pain, then you're you're going to melt away the pornography addiction. So there are a couple of things that are correlated with pornography addiction. So if you look at um, multivariate regression analyses, there are two variables that correlate very highly with pornography addiction. One of them is meaninglessness in life. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, if you can help someone have a reason not to watch pornography and jerk off in the middle of the day, then that will help them a lot. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, uh, this is my population, but like, you know, these are people who are oftentimes young men in their 20s, and they're like falling behind in some way, and it's like 4 p.m. on a Thursday, they're not really working, and like, what else do they have to do? Mm -hmm. So as we start building a life of meaning, like the need for pornography seems to decrease. That's one thing. The second thing is that oftentimes, remember, this is emotional regulation, mm -hmm. and people will have a lot of stored emotions from things like traumatic experiences growing up, romantic relationships, all kinds of other stuff. So as we metabolize that storehouse of emotion, it becomes easier to manage emotions from day to day. They're kind of like built up and your mind kind of stores them in the subconscious. So if we look at something like processing trauma, so I do a lot of like trauma processing for people with pornography addiction. And that sort of takes some of the gas out of the tank that's mm -hmm. fueling the addiction. The third thing to do is to reduce emotions in the present. So teach them alternate coping mechanisms um, that can they, they can use to manage emotions. And oftentimes it's like really life oriented stuff. So if I'm living at home and my parents are toxic, like learning to set better boundaries is one of the best things to teach someone who struggles with pornography addiction. Because usually what's going on is these are people that have someone in their life who is sending them to toxicity, but they feel so guilty at cutting them out. This can even be someone like a, a romantic partner or spouse. It can be a parent. And as they're like receiving the stress it's almost like I, i'll joke with some of my patients that you have an emotional umbilical cord mm -hmm. they're connected to someone else and another human is like transmitting negative emotions to them like a waste product and then they have to turn to substances or pornography or whatever to like offload that emotional stuff so boundary setting emotional regulation techniques processing trauma and like really building purpose in life tends to be like a pretty good like good outcomes you know, so many things come to mind, but I think we're seeing, particularly in young men, like we know that s amounts of sex or frequency of sex is decreasing and that the even birth rates are decreasing. Um, and so do you think this is sort of part of all of this like external stimulation that's around and then they feel sort of, I mean, this is a theory for me, right? They feel wor less meaning, right? Because they're not actually having success in finding someone or meeting someone, or it's just easier to access pornography. And then they're like, you know, they're still not connecting with other people. They're, they're using pornography because they still feel bad. Of course, we talked about the cycle a little bit, but is it sort of like, are these things contributing to that? When you say these things, what do you mean? Like meaning, are we seeing people get porn addiction because they're either having stress in their life. So say they're not coupled with somebody, say they are trying to meet people, but they're having difficulty because I think the dating, the dating world has changed, right? With dating apps and how people communicate and meet each other. It's very different from when you and I were younger. And so um, I think that is, is a very difficult, different sort of place to navigate. Like women are looking for a certain kind of man. And if you don't fill that category, you are immediately filtered out, right? So women are dating the top five, 10% of men are trying to aim for them. And, and then there's a, like a lot of men who are not having success in meeting women. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you have a theory that that's at play. And I think that's completely reasonable. So let's just play around with that a little bit. So the first thing is that, you know, this idea that women are dating the top five to 10% of men, I assume you're talking about like Tinder statistics. Yeah, like those, I mean, because that's where you can filter by height and by, you yeah, know. Yeah, so I think that the, the, there's a couple of interesting, like, once you really look at the data, which I don't know if you have, but I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, anyone who's trained in statistics. So when, when they say they're dating the top 10% of men, there's this idea that 
one dude is dating like nine women, whereas that's not usually what happens. Right. So if you look at something like Tinder, it's like a seven to nine men to one woman like ratio. So when they say they're dating, it's still oftentimes one dude is dating one guy or maybe people are kind of at the top. But like there's such a lopsided gender ratio that it's still like closer to one to one mm -hmm. in, in some ways. It depends on the studies that you look at and stuff like that. So I think that this creates this idea that a lot of men have that like, oh, my God, there's like these chads at the top that are like banging lots of girls. Yeah. I don't think the reality is quite like that when you really look at the statistics. So that's one piece. But I think another thing to really consider that, that I think you kind of hit the nail on the head is that it is harder for men and women to find a good match. Yeah. There are many reasons for that. I think one reason is that, so if we look at like what women want in partners, and this is generalizations, um, so you can look at statistics, right? So like, the idea of a, a dating a dude who lives at home at the age of 28 is like, eh, I don't want someone who's living with their parents. But 50% of people under the age of 30 who are adults still live with their parents, men and women both. Yeah. So the economic situation is changing. So the idea of like an independent man at 28 just doesn't apply to 50% of the population. Yeah. Another good example of this is most women, I want to say like statistics are historically somewhere around 70 to 80% of women will want to date a man who makes more money than they do. Mm -hmm. But 60% of college graduates are now women. Yeah. So what we're starting to see is as equality of income increases, that expectation becomes harder and harder to fill. So whatever the reason is, and there are all kinds of challenges that women have as well. And they get tons of dick pics and all kinds of other things. Yeah. So it's definitely making it harder for men to date. Now, that's just on the gender side. But there's a whole other set of things that's like screwing up dudes, too, which is that, you know, it, as men, like we have very poor emotional regulation skills. We're not really taught how to express emotions beyond mm -hmm. anger. Um, we're unlikely, it's like hard for us to engage in psychotherapy, which I don't think is a weakness of men. I think there's some systemic biases yeah. in psychotherapy that are against men. So if you look at studies on couples counseling, like you ask, ask men, why don't you want to go to couples counseling? And what they, what happens is they feel outgunned. Mm -hmm. So anytime they go see a couples counselor, their female partner, assuming a heteronormative relationship knows how to articulate their feelings and the man doesn't know how to do that yeah. so the, the the wife is like articulating like he does this and this makes me feel this way and the therapist kind of like gets on their side and so men sort of feel like outmatched and i think that there's a good reason for that mm -hmm. so men are, are really struggling right now i think there's a lot of this dating stuff going on there's a lot of expectations that are changing and then there's a lot of like distortions so if you look at i recently saw a paper on incels where their beliefs about what women want are quite divorced from reality. So there are these ideas that, oh, like, you know, the top 10% of dudes are dating all the women. So they assume that, okay, like what that means, right, we can sort of like apply the transitive property is that this woman I'm talking to is only interested in a dude who's in the top 10%. But if you actually ask women, like, who are you interested in and who do you date? It's much more wide and accepting than most men are like understand. You know, it's interesting because in the same breath, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I want to kind of push back a little bit because you said it's not cute to date someone who's living at home, whatever, right? You're like, that's sort of a turn off. And so that's half the male population who's living at home with yeah. their parents, right? And then um, you want people who make more than you and women are more often graduating college, getting higher degrees, getting higher positions. And the average salary of a man is $45,000 in the US. So it sort of seems like there are, I mean, maybe they're not dating the top 10% of men only, Maybe they're just not dating, right? It, yeah. You know, I think that's part of it too. So I'm how is that a pushback? No, no. So my point is like, so there, <laughs> so meaning that there is the, the large majority of men are not finding matches is exactly what you said, but they're not finding matches because women are choosing not to date because their expectations are not being met, which is sort of what you said. But it is, I mean, so they're not wrong in the sense that this woman wants something different than what I have to offer, but they're wrong in saying they only want the 10% of men. Yeah. They just want something different than what I can offer. Yeah. So I think that there's like both can be true. So I think the challenge now is that like, see, we used to need partners. Mm -hmm. So now what's happened is our society has become so independent that a man is not even competing against another man. A man has to add value to a woman's life more so than the stress or annoyance that he brings. And that's true for both genders. Yeah. 
So like this is what's going on is like now it's just easier for me to live by myself than it ever used to be. And so now we're really what, what both genders are competing against is like, is this other person's life better alone or with me? There's also other interesting statistics, like if we look at like men under the age of 30 and stuff like that. So if you look at like, there's also a gender, I mean, sorry, an age gap issue. So if you look at women who are 28 if, and you compare them to like men who are 28, that's kind of a mismatch. But if you look at like, uh, I forget what the statistics are, but there's like a interesting statistic about people under the age of 30 and like, I think maybe like 50 to 70 percent, I'm rusty on the statistic, of men are not dating or don't have, aren't partnered under the age of 30, but that number is lower for women. And the reason for that is because they're dating older men. Yeah. So it's very common. So that skews the, the statistics in some way too. So the younger generation is having less sex. They're less often dating. They're less often than having children. And that leads to the possibility of our, our difficulty in perpetuating our population, having a aging population that's not replaceable. Okay. I think it's important to remember that globally, this is a trend in some places, right? So basically developed nations are seeing this way more. Mm -hmm. So I remember talking to a colleague of mine in China. And so basically like, you know, China had this one child policy for a while. And I heard recently that they have this new policy well, they, where they will subsidize your third and fourth child. Mm -hmm. So what's going on in parts of China, in South Korea, in Japan, less so in the US, is exactly what you're describing, which is that for every, I think we're having like the lowest birth rate is like 0.67. Mm -hmm. So they're not even having one to one. Yeah. So this is a very scary from an aging population. But there are other parts of the world, like if you look at like South America or areas of like the Middle East or, or Africa, where people are having still lots of kids. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't think the species is going to die out. I think what's going to happen is like in developed nations, they're going to have this huge problem of like not having enough young people to support the old people. Yeah. So that I agree with. Was there, I, I, sorry, I forgot your question. No, no, I think that's the issue. And yeah. so like my question is like, what can we, like this is an issue, right? This is a is more societal issue than an individual issue, but it's a problem. And so what do you think, like are there things that you think that we should be addressing? Yeah, so I, I think that I don't focus on societal issues. I know it's kind of weird. So <laughs> despite the fact that we have this like large scale approach, I still at my heart am a clinician. So when I work with men who are struggling to date or working with women who are struggling to date, what I always focus on is the individual. And so I think what we really need to do, like what I would love to do is like make a school for crappy boyfriends. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that for crappy girlfriends because I don't know what it's like to be a, a crappy girlfriend. Like, but I, I think that there's a lot of like skills training that we're seeing. So like, what, what should we intervene in? I think uh, social skills atrophy is huge. Mm -hmm. So what's happening when we start to use technology is like, as you know, any part of your brain that you don't use, like rusts. Mm -hmm. So if you don't speak a language, you'll forget it because your brain is like, hey, we don't need this. So as we move to like text-based communication, what started to happen is our empathic circuits have started to atrophy. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a rise of social anxiety. And why is that? That's because when I sit with you, I see body language, I see facial expression, I interpret it. And so this part of my brain works well. But now the more that we text, then when we meet in person, I'm going to feel incredibly anxious. So we're seeing a rise in social anxiety in both genders. So that's really what I think we need to target is like, how can you be a more emotionally available partner? How can you be like more confident in yourself? We're seeing like low self-esteem problems, a lot of shame, you know, and social skills atrophy. So these are the things that I kind of focus on. And like, how can you, whether you're a man or a woman, we have everyone in our community, like become just a better human being. Yeah. And then I think as you become a better human being, what we tend to see is that the relationship kind of like comes pretty naturally. But this is not a societal program. I'd love to make it one. Well, I think I think if you did it on an individual level for many, many people at scale, it would help society overall, right? Like, because yeah. I think you're right. Social skills are definitely less... Uh, less robust, right? In the in the age of technology, I worry about how our kids, I mean, I sort of force my kids to like communicate with people. We go out, like you have to have a conversation. You have to yeah. learn those skills because otherwise, you know, they'll be looking at their phone or looking at devices or, I mean, they don't have a phone, but like they'll be looking at some TV or something else or trying to get a dopamine fix through something else. And so um, that is, you know, a real problem, I think, in society today, in our, at least in the developed countries where there's lots of access to these things. Absolutely. And I, I think now that I realize it, so, so we have lectures on those topics. So even at scale, I know I sort of said I work with individuals, but 
what I've sort of done is like I, we did two lectures on communication and relationships, and we have two lectures coming up on like how to build meaningful connections. And, and so there's a lot of science that we can really utilize. And once we understand how connections form, so I think like a good example of this is people don't realize what leads to attraction. Mm -hmm. So the science of attraction is like really fascinating. And the interesting thing is that Tinder does, the data points that Tinder collects don't correlate at all with attraction. So your interests and things like that don't actually govern attraction in the brain. Yeah. So it's interesting things like shared emotional experiences. So there's a super fascinating study where they had people go on first dates on a rickety bridge or a stone bridge. Mm -hmm. And on the stone bridge, it's stable. And it was like, whatever. But when you have people meet in the middle of a rickety bridge, your sympathetic nervous system is activated. Both people are a little bit scared and anxious. And when there's an, a similar emotional experience, it can even be negative. Um, this results in like some kind of bond being formed emotionally. So there are some of these things like you have to you know keep your date under 75 minutes because something happens in terms of like attraction and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff that we can actually teach people to help them kind of like compensate for the social skills atrophy. That's interesting. That's really fascinating. Are you loving the Rena Malik MD podcast? Well, I love each and every one of you. And I'm truly honored that you choose to spend a bit of your day or a bit of your week with me. Did you ever hear the actual story of why I started making content online? Well, when I was a resident, I remember having a patient who had bladder cancer. And in order to treat her bladder cancer, we had to remove it and then reconstruct a new bladder called an Indiana pouch. Now, with this new bladder, she would have to catheterize herself through a stoma or an opening on her abdomen in order to empty her bladder. So after surgery, immediately she did great. She went home and no major issues. But subsequently, over the next couple months, she started getting readmitted over and over again to the intensive care unit. And we were really wondering what was going on. Eventually, we figured out that she didn't truly understand that she now had to catheterize herself to empty her bladder. Just the simplest thing that was so pivotal, she didn't understand that. And it was then that I realized as a urologist, I could do the perfect surgery. But if my patient didn't understand the consequences of that surgery, then I failed as their doctor. And once I started practice, I realized that I couldn't teach people everything they needed to know in the 15 or 30 minutes I saw them in my office. And that's when I started creating all my Rena Malik MD content to offer free education to people around the world. And I can tell you that it has been truly one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. And in order to keep providing free content, we need your help. If you are getting value out of this podcast or my other content, I encourage you to join our premium membership. As a member, you'll get early access to the audio and video of the podcast completely ad-free, transcripts of all the episodes, and exclusive access to Ask Me Anything episodes that occur once a month. And during those episodes, I answer questions that are asked only by premium members. So join us today at renamalik.supercast.com. Can't wait to see you there. I wanted to go back to you mentioned something about when you have sex with someone, you create a bond with them, right? And so how does that work in terms of casual sex, like in terms of the brain, like you're having casual sex with multiple partners, how does that affect you in your brain and how you see future partners or see yourself? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, let me try to approach it from a couple different angles. So the first thing that I found is that I think it is natural in the sense of from an evolutionary perspective to bond with someone that you have sex with. That being said, what we're seeing is different kinds of behaviors now in which that doesn't happen so or happens in different ways so i was like just looking at research on polyamory for example and and the research on polyamory shows that people who are polyamorous and in relationships are relatively happy but i think there are some biases in the research because they're doing research on people who are in polyamorous relationships they're not studying the people who were in a polyamorous and relationship no and are no longer one so all of the research on polyamory is biased towards the success cases and no one is looking at people who tried to open up their relationship and fell apart which i suspect is the majority of people so anytime you have sex with someone there is a tendency to bond mm -hmm. and what i tend to find is that it, with people who are having more and more casual sex 
we are seeing more and more emotional suppression. So this is from technology, so we're just numbing out our amygdala and limbic system on the whole, which I think makes it easy. We're also seeing a lot of dehumanizing behavior. So the other thing that people that allows people to have casual sex and not bond is like burnout. Mm -hmm. So the more burnt out you are, the more your empathic circuitry is exhausted, the harder it is to form a bond. And when I have patients who are in relationships where they have like casual sex, I oftentimes find that as we do like emotional healing, casual sex becomes more difficult. That being said, there are absolutely people who are able to have casual sex and can even form like somewhat of a healthy emotional bond that does not necessarily mean like romantic ownership. You can still appreciate someone and like acknowledge them and like bond with them. Um, and if you look at studies on polyamory, you actually find that there's like very strong, positive, emotional, they're able to have emotional connections without it sort of resulting in ownership. Mm -hmm. So polyamory is a good example of like, it's not actually casual sex, there's like emotional parts of it that they're able to manage. It's ethical non-monogamy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, uh, <laughs> or consensual non-monogamy. Yeah, so, so and, and people like to think it's ethical, but you know, I've been on the flip side where I see people who oftentimes feel trapped because if their partner says like I want this and it's like the in thing to do and I want to be supportive of my partner even if it's emotionally hurting me I've seen that a lot mm -hmm. I just don't think that that gets advertised very much you know I will share this with you I just interviewed somebody about choking in, in during sex rough sex and apparently it's it's a very vanilla thing to do these days with the younger maybe you know this but um, it was news to me I didn't know that it was so commonplace um, and again there was a lot of sort of in these you know, qualitative interviews of like, yeah, well, my partner likes it, so I do it and I accept it. And I wonder why, um, you know, of course, when you're young and your brain is developing, but like why you would, as a, as a species where asphyxiation is essentially dangerous, that you would accept something like that if you didn't like it. Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think there's a physiologic aspect, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the asphyxiation does something to the neurochemistry of the brain. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at it, like even meditative states that are induced usually by l very low respiratory rates. Mm -hmm. So we'll have like a respiratory rate, like, you know, the average respiratory rate is like 12 to 14. But in some states of meditation, you're having one breath like every five minutes. And so we, we know that for some people, there's a physiologic change in the brain that intensifies the sexual experience once you add asphyxiation. Oh, no, I understand picture. why people yeah. like it, but I'm saying people who self-proclaim that they don't really like it, that they don't in, they don't find the pleasure in it, but they do it because their partner likes it. That's sort of where I think it's it's a little murky because it's they may not be getting that benefit from it. But when you say these people like it, they do it because their partner likes it, or are they the ones doing the asphyxiating? No, they they're the ones, ones getting asphyxiated. Oh, so, but but then the so the partner wants to asphyxiate, asphyxiate. them. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. So, that's right. <laughs> so, mo most of most. Of, I mean, I'm not trying to judge people, but most of the people that I've worked with who enjoy asphyxiation, they're the ones getting asphyxiated. Yeah. No. And so it's the other way around. And again, this is not the standard. Not everybody, but the majority of the in heteronormative relationships, it's the male doing the asphyxiating, and they are sometimes asking for it or um, saying, let's try this. And then the partner says, yes, doesn't really like it. And then they're like, oh, but it's okay that my partner likes to do it. Yeah. So I think that's like weirder. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not, like not to be judgmental, but right. like, so, so I, I think that there's a why weirder. I mean, there is more to it than a simple physiological mm -hmm. induction of a neuroscientific state right. that enhances sexual pleasure. Is it a way that we feel like we have to appease our partners? Is there like a you know, psychological explanation for that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, like, let's start with the psychological explanation of why I would want to choke someone who doesn't enjoy it. So this <laughs> Well, they may not realize because the person is saying, yeah, it's yeah. good, right? Because they want to please their partner. So they're not realizing th that maybe there's a lack of communication. Maybe the partner's doing it because they think the partner, the, the, the female partner likes it and the female partner's saying, yeah, it's good because they want to please their partner and there's sort of this miscommunication. But whatever the case is, um, if, if it is truly that the male partner likes it and the female partner doesn't, but she's saying yes to appease them. That's sort of where my questioning is. 
Yeah. So what 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 exactly is the question there? Like, why does so? That yeah. Why do people? Why it doesn't have to be asphyxiation, but why do people do things to appease their partner? When I mean, this one is a, an example because it could be dangerous, right? Like you could actually have injury. So that's why it sort of gives me pause and alarm to yeah, hear about that. Right? I, I, me too. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think if we ask, like you know, like you know, I hope it's okay. You're married, right? Yeah. And there are things that we're not talking about sex here, but just, there are all kinds of things in a marriage that, that a partner do. does yeah, to yeah. appease. Yeah, that's fine. Partner. I get that right that, so, but I mean, i'm wondering like why you would why because it doesn't make a sense evolutionarily that you would put yourself in harm's way to appease someone else if you didn't like it maybe and maybe they don't realize it's harmful but your body sh- should give you some signal that that's not feeling very good yeah so so i, I mean i i think that what i tend to see is like i don't want to standardize and i can't hypothesize on these people but generally speaking what i've worked what i've seen in my patients is that when someone the more willing someone is to appease their partner in an unhealthy way, the more disturbed their attachment style is, the more likely there is to be a history of trauma. Oftentimes these people don't feel comfortable communicating. Mm -hmm. And it's not even necessarily like their partner's fault. So I'm like thinking about one particular patient that like never fought with their partner. And like that's not healthy for anybody right right so so this person was just grew up in such an environment where they like learned very like in a, in a very conditioning way that i'm not allowed to express any kind of like discomfort or disagreement or something like that and so i think that the more extreme your survival signals should be going off because someone is joking you yeah the stronger that psychological conditioning probably has to be yeah but i, I think one thing i've learned as a psychiatrist is that like once you get someone in, in your office, the reasons that someone does or doesn't do something is actually way more vast than you would realize. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there may be something trauma related, which is like a good safe guess if we're talking about like a board question, like that's what I would circle. <laughs> that's really interesting. Um, so what do you think, um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and I don't know the answer, but now with VR, AR, um, being able to like feel like you're in a erotic film or potentially the future of like sex dolls that are realistic and AI. What do you think that's going to do in terms of our mental state and how we bond with people? <laughs> okay. So this, I think, is, so you were worried about like, you know, the lack of birth rate or whatever. Like <laughs> this, I seriously think could like end the human race. Like, no, I'm, and that's, I'm worried about that. So, so, so I think this is what's going to happen. Okay. So, Someone is soon going to figure out. So if we look at the trend in technology addiction, okay, this is what's going on. So first we had a video game and then a video game activated our dopamine. And then we had like friends lists. We had communities. We had guilds. We had massively multiplayer online RPGs. And so over time, what, what has happened is gaming scratches different itches in the brain. So we're getting more whole brain effects. And the more of a whole brain effect you can create, the more likely someone is to play a video game. So we look at relationships, something weird, right? Which is that sometimes you're dating someone or you're married to someone or whatever. And like, even though there's drama in the relationship, somehow the drama pulls you in. Yeah. And so I think what we're going to see is like AI girlfriends that start or boyfriends that start like having drama. Like they're going to start like getting mad at you and they're going to start having fights. And someone is going to figure out from an algorithmic sense what is the right amount of denial of reward, which I'm, I'm sure you understand, right? Random yeah. reinforcement schedules and like gambling. They're going to start inputting gambling mechanics into virtual systems. We're so fucked. <laughs> we, we really are. We really are. And then this is going to addict people even more. And then as these virtual AI like girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever become more and more robust, um, as they become like more, as you mentioned, like they're going to get integrated into sex dolls and like physical sensations and things like that. You're going to have emotional connections where they're going to be like activating emotional circuitry. You're going to, and, and then like the crazy thing is that after she like denies you, she's going to come and apologize. And then that's going to make you feel really great. Right. And so the closer we get to approximating a real relationship, I think the more pulled into this we're going to get. Yeah. So my hope was that they would be at least the, and, I, and I, I'm sure this is correct, that the initial ones will be very like acquiescent like they will just be very nice and they will do they will say yes to everything there won't be that that negative sort of random reinforcement so i was like that that won't people won't like that forever but if they do evolve to what you're saying we're totally fucked Uh, absolutely so i think that's what's going to happen right so so unless someone stops it 
Yeah. And then we're going to we're going to slowly add other qualities to AI girlfriends adding the physical dimension like who knows like I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen but then like you know they're they're going to evolve and to do everything you would want a real person to do in the perfect way uh, actually like the I would, perfect amount of way like yes. yes so what i would say everything they're going to be so perfect that they do things that you don't want them to do right because because we need that <laughs> we need that yeah that is oh my gosh okay that's scary <laughs> So if you were Surgeon General and you could put in any policy that you want to like to to better the universe right now, what would you do? If I was Surgeon General, I would resign and make Vivek Murthy. I would tell him to take my place. So he's a, he's a <laughs> That's fantastic a great guy. answer. That's a great I, answer. I, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm not trying to kiss his ass. It's, yeah, ju yeah. it's just like, honestly, like, so, so I, I mean, if I could put any policy in place, probably what I would do is create a mental health training curriculum as part of our core k-12 education, K -12 education. Yeah. yeah so in ancient india like we taught kids like mathematics and how to meditate so we taught kids how to control your desires how to train your attention so if we look at some of this like you know this work that we do with like adhd and stuff like that we train people how to control their mind and i think that like everyone needs to learn this because what's going on right now is that we don't know how to control our mind but the people who develop technology are getting better and better and better at it. So literally what is happening is that psychiatry is the only field of medicine where we are losing the war. So I, I mean, maybe this is untrue. I don't know about urological outcomes, but I would bet money that over the last 50 years, urological outcomes have improved. Yes. Yes, but I think that comorbidities have gotten worse because of other things, and that's overall made urologic outcomes like you know more prevalent. So erectile dysfunction and cancers and and those sort of incontinence, all the things that we see, um, sort of more common. Even then, I would say that that is losing. That's a loss on psychiatry. So what we're what what's, what we're seeing is we're not able to control human beings' behaviors, right? And so even though our technology and urology, cardiology, things like that, we've gotten better at PET scans and MRIs and whatever, mm -hmm. our science has improved, but we're losing the war on mental health. And I think the reason for that is because we have stopped learning how to utilize our mind. And then on the flip side, we have people like app developers, which like, I don't think they're all evil, but there's like two groups of people who call their users, users, drug dealers and app developers. Right. Otherwise, it's like clients or patients, but they're users. And, and so what's happening is all of these people are getting more sophisticated. And as they get more sophisticated, they know how to prey on your brain. And there are even like scientific studies on something called the attention marketplace, where you have people who are now neuroeconomists who are studying like human behavior and trying to figure out like, you know, this is way beyond advertising and marketing. Like, how can I control someone's mind so that they buy something? We see this a lot. There's actually like a sports betting epidemic right now. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is that we now allow people to place bets at 2 a.m. when their frontal lobes are completely exhausted and they can't like control what they do. So technology is getting get better at exploiting us. And so I think what we've seen, at least in our community, is Thankfully, if you learn like yoga and meditation, and all this kind of stuff, if you learn how to train and control your mind, it can help you control technology addiction, pornography addiction, video game addiction, all that kind of stuff. So that's probably what I would implement. Yeah, I mean, I think education at a young age needs to be revamped to include a lot of things. Um, from my perspective, I always talk about how sexual education would do leaps and bounds because there's one, so much misinformation, two, people don't know anything right they don't they learn how to put on a condom they learn basic consent they learn how to avoid stis and pregnancies that's it and they don't learn what the anatomical parts are they don't learn how to and they, their parents aren't talking about it enough so they're learning about how to pleasure someone through pornography which is not reflective of real life right it's so actually one in like one fourth of teenagers are learning through pornography based on data that we have and so just one fourth well at least that's a few years old but yeah i mean it's probably more than that right but at least one fourth admit to it in whatever survey they did so that's a lot like yeah. like and so if people knew what sex should be like and what actually uh female partners like what male partners like i mean there's on both sides right men have a lot of expectations of performance women are expected to enjoy penetration immediately and orgasm within minutes like none of this is accurate right and so if they were taught what is normal function what is normal anatomy what is pleasure I think people would be so much happier because you know, just as well as I do, the devastation that comes with 
difficulties in the sexual domain. Do you have a good resource for what you consider like what they should be taught? Like, is that something that you put together at some point? I haven't or? yet. And I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. work on it. There is actually, I just learned of today, there's a website called Make Love Not Porn, where that's essentially what mm -hmm. this person is trying to do. And um, it's fascinating because she couldn't get any funding and, and like from anyone, because nobody found it worthy of investing mm -hmm. whereas like you know you can think about all the other things that are sexually oriented that get lots of funding and lots of you know uh, lots of advertising that allows yeah. them to offer it for free so yes i'm going to work on making a sexual education course that hopefully schools will use but um you know i think and the same i think in terms of digital media they're doing digital media education in like australia now and probably in some schools here they're trying to start implementing that but i think it's super important yeah yeah, absolutely. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to talk about? Nope, I, I think this was great. Okay, well, I have a few questions I ask everybody, just sort of like um, more about you than than your expertise. But what's something you know now in your life that you wish you knew earlier? You know, that's interesting. I, I mean, I hope this isn't an annoying an answer, but I'd say nothing. One of the things that I've come to appreciate is like, ignorance earlier in my life has helped me like kind of become the person that I am. And like, there are certain things like I failed out of college, for example. And so like, there were times in my life where I wish I could go back and change that. But I, I really wouldn't. Yeah, because if I knew different things, then I would have acted differently. And then I wouldn't be where I am now. Yeah. And I'm really happy with where I am now. That's great. I mean, that's really so, great. Yeah. And it's not a BS answer. I know it sounds like a BS no, no, answer. No, no, but, but I mean, I think uh, I really believe that strongly is that your journey is individual to you. Yeah. And, and if one thing was different, you wouldn't be where you are. Yeah. Right. And, and so like, if you hadn't almost failed out college, you wouldn't have gone to India. You wouldn't have learned all the, all the, you know, Eastern traditional things that have influenced you and perhaps gotten into medical school later and, and pursued psychiatry and all the things. That Absolutely. Have come from. So I'm, I'm happy with where I am and like, I'll take all the decisions and all the ignorance. <laughs> That's great. What is a non-negotiable for you? Something you have to do every day? I mean, aside from like physiologic functions. Yeah, like not like people say sleep a lot, but I'm like, okay, everyone has to sleep. Right? I mean, so I, 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 don't, I don't, I don't know that I have a non-negotiable. I think the clo the thing that I enjoy the most is like oftentimes watching esports while I have like a cup of coffee or tea in the morning. That is the thing that I enjoy the most, and is like the one thing that I try to hang on to. But really, after like being in an ashram for a while, like. There's not, <laughs> you don't right. need anything. Yeah, that's what you learn is that yeah. we think we have all these non-negotiables, but like, you know, if you don't have what, like, can I ask you, like, what's I one? I don't have one. Yeah, so like, one. like if you, oftentimes parents learn this the hard way is like you had all these non-negotiables before you became a parent. Yeah. And then like your kid gets rid of that and it's like, it's not that bad. Like yeah. you don't Like I would love to say I have to go outside every day and I would love to say that I could do that, but there's some days where I just can't. I can't, yeah. I can't literally, um, maybe I can step outside for a couple minutes, but I can't like do a walk in nature like I would love to, or I can't meditate every day. Um, and I think that's okay, but yeah. I always find it really inspirational when people are like, yeah, I I have made it my like my thing to do this xyz every day and it's helped me in, in some sort of way yeah but um what's a health hack or life hack that you would share so one is that meditating twice a day is exponentially better than meditating once a day can i ask how long yeah so i will meditate for 20 to 30 minutes twice a day so if you look at most of the studies, like probably around 18 minutes is what you need to shut off ACTH production and reduce cortisol and things like that. Most of the clinical studies on mindfulness or meditation show clinical benefits with like 20 minutes of meditation. But I think this is where there's a big difference between physiologic benefits and spiritual benefits. And what I found is meditating twice a day for 20 to 30 minutes the first time you meditate is going to give you physiological benefits. But if you really want to ac accelerate your spiritual growth, you need to meditate twice a day because it's that second day where you clean out all the physiology stuff and then you're really like primed for like spiritual growth. That's fascinating. Um, and is it like certain times of day? Or any any two times you can no, so I mean, so any two times will work, but generally speaking, dawn and dusk, and there's like interesting stuff about our circadian rhythm and things like that. So even if you look at like visual acuity during dawn and dusk is like the highest, which is why sunsets are so beautiful. Um, so dawn and dusk are the two best times to meditate during the day. So if you can do that, great. And what's your second thing? The second thing is this concept in Ayurveda of sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. So see a lot of people like, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but on some days you're sluggish and it's like harder to get yourself to do the things that you want to do. And then there are other days where it's like easy for your body and your mind to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And so basically what the yogis figured out a long time ago is that there's a way to balance your mind by making it sattvic. And rajasic means overly passionate or active. 
and thamsic means like inert. But there are certain certain things that you can do, like food that you can eat and things like that. So eliminating most, if not all, psychoactive substances will help you over time. So the main kind of life hack is what can you do today that will put you in a better frame of mind tomorrow? So if you like drink even like a glass of wine at night, that will interfere a tiny bit with your REM sleep overnight, which can affect you the next day. So what I really try to tell people to do is do like whatever you can today. And it's not about today. It's like set yourself up for like a good day tomorrow. Well, that's like also impinging on delayed gratification, which is tough for people, right? Like you are sort of looking for... So that's what I mean. So th your ability to handle delayed gratification depends on how sattvic your mind is. Yeah. So that's, that's, the, it's kind of like the linchpin is like, yeah, you're absolutely right that it's hard, but that's the whole point is like, once you get started on that path, once you s sleep a good night, it's easier to delay gratification tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then you do the next thing and then you do the next thing. And this is sort of from the yogic literature, like being sattvic. So you're doing mind body practices, changing your diet, eliminating psychoactive substances. All that stuff is really good. That's great. I'm going to add one more question. Sure. Because, because you've been in the Eastern medicine, sort of Eastern philosophy, you know, there's a lot of sort of uh, Ayurvedic medicine, herbal supplementation. Are there certain things that you've taken from that, uh, that, that you recommend your patients take? Oh, I mean, so I, I like uh, started a consult service at Mass General that was evidence-based complementary and alternative medicine. Um, so it just depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. So I, I know we're seeing like good evidence for things like Brahmi, Ashwagandha, um, turmeric sometimes is an anti-inflammatory. So it depends on the condition. So I don't, I don't recommend that everyone. There's not something. like one thing. For yeah. Everybody. So yeah. the closest thing I would say is probably meditation. So we mm -hmm. have clinical trials on meditation for all mental health issues. And so that's like the one thing that seems to be like a panacea. It's kind of like exercise mm -hmm. where it helps everything. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, cool. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into the Rena Malik MD podcast. If you're enjoying this content, please be sure to go onto YouTube, subscribe to our channel and go to Apple and Spotify and leave a rating or review. This really helps us reach more people and is a free zero cost way to support the podcast. And I will greatly appreciate you. Also, if you like my content, feel free to follow me on social media. My handle is at Rina Malik MD on most platforms. And as always, I'm going to take care of yourself because you're worth it.